Welcome to Spooky History. In today's episode, we're hopping aboard the luxury liner Titanic. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> oh, a cursed mummy, you say? Let's take a look. The Washington Post is a well-respected newspaper. Since its founding in 1877, it has won 69 Pulitzer Prizes, the second most of any publication after the New York Times. And its journalists have received 18 Nyman Fellowships and 368 White House News Photographer Association Awards. The newspaper boasts such scoops as the first investigation into what became known as the Watergate scandal, the 1971 Pentagon Papers, and the 2019 Afghanistan Papers. But one of the Post's lesser known triumphs was on May 12, 1912, when it broke the scoop that the Titanic had, in fact, been sunk by a cursed mummy. Ghost of the Titanic, vengeance of hoodoo mummy, followed man who wrote its history, proclaimed the headline. We've discussed mummy curses in general previously, but this specific one was the British Museum's exhibit number 22542, The Unlucky Mummy, supposedly that of a priestess of Amun-Ra, the creator of the universe and king of the gods. The story, told in the Washington Post article and elaborated on elsewhere, goes that Sometime in the mid-1860s, five recent Oxford graduates were sightseeing in Egypt when they bought a souvenir. The perfectly preserved coffin lid of this priestess dating from around 950 to 900 BC. A few hours after acquiring the coffin, the man who paid was seen walking out towards the desert. He never returned. The next day, one of the remaining three men was accidentally shot in Cairo, his arm was so severely wounded that it had to be amputated, and the third man, named Arthur Wheeler, found on his return home that the bank holding his entire savings had failed. He managed to turn things around and move to America, only to lose his new fortune to both a flood and a fire. The fourth man suffered a severe illness, lost his job, and was reduced to selling matches in the street. The coffin lid was then placed under the care of Wheeler's sister, who attempted to have it photographed in 1887. The photographer died, as did the porter. The man asked to translate the hieroglyphs on the lid took his own life. The remains passed into the hands of a London businessman. After three of his family members had been injured in a road accident and his house damaged by fire, the businessman decided possession was nine-tenths of the gnaw and donated it to the British Museum. Records show the artifact that became known as the Unlucky Mummy was presented to the British Museum by a Mr. A. F. Wheeler on behalf of a Mrs. Warwick Hunt of Holland Park in 1890. What they cannot verify is the claim that, as the coffin was being unloaded, the truck suddenly went into reverse and trapped a passerby. Then, as the casket was being lifted up the stairs by two workmen, one fell and broke his leg, the other, apparently in perfect health, died unaccountably two days later. Once the princess was installed in the Egyptian room, the museum's night watchman frequently heard frantic hammering and sobbing from the coffin. Other exhibits in the room were also often hurled about at night. Cleaners refused to go near the exhibit. Then a photographer took a photo of the coffin when he developed it. The image that appeared was that of a living Egyptian woman staring straight before her with an expression of singular malevolence. Soon afterwards, the photographer died suddenly and mysteriously. One legend asserts the unlucky mummy's ghost travelled down secret passageways to haunt the British Museum's tube station, now abandoned, and Holborn station, and was responsible for the disappearance of two women at one of those tube stops. Shortly before the former shut in 1933, Two British newspapers offered a cash reward to anyone brave enough to spend a night alone there. Nobody took up the challenge. By this point, the legend of the unlucky mummy was well established, having first been reported over 30 years earlier in the ever-reliable Daily Mail. One of the many follow-up articles over the following years was written by Bertram Fletcher Robinson, a skeptic whose quest to debunk the story ended in his own conviction of the truth. In his 1904 article for the Daily Express, A Priestess of Death, Robinson wrote, It is certain that the Egyptians had powers which we in the 20th century may laugh at, yet can never understand. Many of his friends were convinced the well he was returning to was just a poisoned chalice, including Sherlock Holmes creator Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. 
A few years earlier, Robinson had helped him develop the Hound of the Baskervilles in his native West Country, but now it was Doyle trying to educate his friend. I warned Mr. Robinson against concerning himself with the mummy at the British Museum. I told him he was tempting fate by pursuing his inquiries, but he was fascinated and would not desist. Robinson thought he would be spared, writing, Perhaps it is that the priestess only used her powers against those who brought her into the light of day and kept her as an ornament of a private room, but that now, standing among queens and princesses of equal rank, she no longer makes use of the malign powers which she possesses. Perhaps. Either way, a few weeks later, Robinson was dead at the age of just 36 after a three-week illness, his article unpublished. Eventually, the story goes, the museum sold the unlucky mummy to an American archaeologist who dismissed the happenings as superstition and coincidence, before arranging to have the antique shipped to America on a vessel deemed unsinkable. And then, on the night of April 14th, the unlucky mummy sank into the sub-zero waters of the North Atlantic, along with 1,500 passengers. Or, so the story goes. And the story goes very far, off a cliff. In fact, because most of what is verifiable is obviously not true. First of all, despite being called the unlucky mummy, as we have said, there is no mummy involved, just the top part of its inside casing of the coffin. Whatever happened to the mummy that was once inside is unknown, but it definitely didn't accompany its lid to England and the British Museum, so presumably it stayed in Egypt, where almost anything might have happened to it, including being eaten by the British. But that's another story. Secondly, it wasn't the body of a princess or a priestess, as had been reported, though it must have been that of someone rich and influential. There is no name on the board and no curse upon those who disturbed her. Thirdly, with only a few exceptions we have put names to, almost all the supposed deaths and accidents that befell people around the headboard have no contemporary evidence to support them. Fourthly, shipping records show no dead Egyptian mummy of any kind was on board the Titanic. As for the lid, it's still in the British Museum, where it stayed consistently from 1889 to 1990. Since then, it's formed part of three temporary exhibitions in Australia and Taiwan, always returning to its place in Room 62 of the British Museum. Various versions of the story try to explain different parts of this away, including by saying the mummy was smuggled aboard the Titanic and placed in one of the lifeboats. But if that had been the case, you would have thought someone would have noticed sharing a bench with a 3,000-year-old corpse, and might at some point have brought up that it had a place which could have gone to a living person, or even one of the numerous pets that weren't allowed onto the lifeboats. Wait, they didn't allow the pets on the lifeboats? These stories also claim the rich American tried to bring it back to the UK twice, first on the Empress of Ireland and then on the Lusitania, two ships also famous for their sinking with huge loss of life on the very journeys that the unlucky mummy was supposed to be on board. So that still doesn't explain how it got back to the British Museum without anyone noticing it had been missing for over three years. Oh, and if you think those additions to the unlucky mummy mythos are a bit over the top, it has also been blamed for the start of World War I, having apparently once been presented to the Kaiser who, as we all know, personally shot Archduke Franz Ferdinand explicitly with the aim of starting a world war because of the mummy. And maybe there was a second shooter, perhaps on a grassy knoll, and maybe it was a mummy too. The hysteria around the mummy has been beneficial to the British Museum, however. At its height in the early 20th century, it was receiving many letters from as far away as New Zealand and Algiers, containing money to buy flowers to be placed at Armin Ra's feet, which the museum put towards its general upkeep instead. The linking of the coffin lid with a cursed mummy seems to have been an intentional hoax perpetrated according to Professor Bob Breyer by Douglas Murray and T.W. Stead, two Englishmen who claimed they knew of a mummy brought to England and placed in a drawing room of an acquaintance. The morning after the mummy arrived, everything breakable in the room was destroyed. The mummy was moved to several rooms in the house, each time with the same result. 
Soon after these supposed events, Murray instead visited the first Egyptian room of the British Museum, where they saw the coffin lid, number 22542, of a priestess of Amun. They decided that the face on the lid was that of a tormented soul, and told this to the newspapers, which were eager to print sensational stories, especially about mummies and curses. Soon the coffin lid became identified with the destructive mummy. The two elements would themselves become associated with the Titanic when one of the perpetrators of the hoax, William Stead, tragically went down with the ill-fated ship on the 15th of April 1912. Along with Bertram Fletcher, Robinson Stead is possibly the only provable life that came into contact with the mummy and was cut short. And like Robinson, Stead never owned it. At the time of his death, it was rumoured that he was due to be awarded the Nobel Peace Prize later that year. The first editor to employ female journalists, he was famous for campaigning against many social ills, including slums and child prostitution. In fact, as early as 1886, he had tried to draw attention to the necessity of more lifeboats on passenger liners. However, Stead's presence on the Titanic does place the mummy there, if only in conversation. A few days after the Titanic sinking, one of the survivors, Frederick K. Seward, recounted how Stead regaled his fellow passengers with his cursed mummy tale into the early hours of the 13th. This, possibly along with the 1838 loss of the Menkor sarcophagus in the sinking of the Beatrice somewhere near Cartagena, is presumably how the myth of the unlucky mummy being aboard the Titanic came about. That is the closest the unlucky mummy came to being on board, and if there was a curse attached to its coffin, or even a body still in existence, we will probably never know. Maybe William Stead was indeed unwise to tell the story of a cursed object on the night leading into the 13th, whatever and wherever the object in question was. We hope you enjoyed that episode of Spooky History. Don't forget to hit the bell icon to be notified of videos, like and subscribe, and if you want to support our work, you can donate to us at paypal.me forward slash noisyghostent. Thanks for watching, and please do have nightmares. Goodbye.